We've talked about Jesus' life all throughout the world, I mean, all throughout the year, but this week we're focusing upon his last week of life, which began on Sunday. Last, we studied Sunday yesterday, and what did we study yesterday? What did Jesus do? That's right. Jesus did die on the cross. But what did he do on the first day when he came into Jerusalem? What happened? Yes, sir. Not yet. The first day of the week, on that last week, when people began throwing things in the street. Do you remember now? What was that? That's right, they were throwing clothes, and they were throwing branches, and they were announcing what to everyone? Okay, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and they say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Right, blessed is the king. So we welcomed him yesterday, like the people of Jerusalem did, welcoming him into the city as king. But we're going to discover today that so much is going to happen that he's going to pray and be in a lot of distress. And we're going to talk about that today. But remember that the important thing we're studying about Jesus is that he came to show us the love of God. Because if God loves you, I love you. And we're all together following him. We're going to ask the Blue Tribe to go first to your rotation. You don't have to leave solemnly. You can leave happily. Orange Drive, you're welcome to go. But you have to walk smiling. You have to smile all the way out. Smile at everybody as you walk by them. And then have a green drive. <laughs> One thing we gather from our study of scripture is that Jesus prayed a lot. And our assignment for tonight is going to be taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, as well as the Gospel, uh, the gospel of Matthew and Mark. But Jesus prayed at his baptism. He prayed to bless children. He prayed for Peter's faith. And what we're going to discover tonight is he prayed for you. But what's the context about this reading of Jesus in the garden? Obviously, you understand from the songs that we've just sung. And, of course, what I said to the kids before they left, that's exactly what we're studying about is the prayer of Jesus in the garden. But a lot of times we focus upon those private prayers that occurred when he went a stone's throw away from the disciples that he had chose to go with him. But that prayer began earlier that night. Not that he continued praying one solid prayer, but the prayer actually begins in the Gospel of John. But I want you to look at the context. 
We are studying about John 17, where Jesus intercedes for his disciples. We're going to follow him into Gethsemane, where his agony manifests itself in the prayer that he utters. And then John chapter 18, verses 1 through 12, will show the betrayal and the arrest that will occur in Jesus' ministry. Everything outlined in gold there from the Gospel of John is what the assignment is for but when we think of Jesus' prayer in the garden, we don't put John 17 typically with that. But Jesus makes this interesting point. Look in John chapter 14. I should say he makes this interesting point. He just says this. In John chapter 14, as he has been speaking to them, from the moment when the Lord's Supper is instituted and he washes the feet of the disciples in the upper room. Notice in verse 31 says, on the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. And then what does it say? Get up and let's go. Well, he tells them, get up and let's go. So what do you think is going to happen in chapter 15 and verse 1? They're going to get up and go. And when he begins talking in chapter 15, what is recorded in chapter 15, I think, is Jesus talking while they're walking. It's possible to do that. And the irony in all of this is that the very first thing that he speaks in chapter 15 is this, I am the vine, which would have been well seen in everything that they were looking at as they walked. Even in chapter 16 and verse 13, 33, the last thing he says is, uh, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I have overcome the world. It's almost as if that is the finality of the, the conversation as they have been walking, beginning in chapter 15. And then it says in the next verse of chapter 17, and then Jesus spoke these things, these things, everybody, what things? The things that he just said. And then he looked up to heaven. Now, I realize that it might be true to be able to say that when I'm looking here in this building and I looked up to heaven, you probably wouldn't have written down, Don looked up to heaven, what would you have said? Don looked up and saw the ceiling. But the fact that it says that he looked up into heaven probably suggests that they're outside. So when we come to this point, notice in John 16, verse 17, then some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he's telling us in a little while? You won't see me again in a little while. You will see me again because I'm going to the Father. They said, there's a conversation occurring around Jesus that Jesus is not part of. And then Jesus overhears them and pulls that conversation into what he says to them. What I want you to see is that this is a conversation in motion because Jesus is walking them to the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, where we remember the prayers that he speaks in private. But this is a prayer he prays for his disciples. This is a view of what is considered to be the Garden of Gethsemane, looking up into Jerusalem. I wish it was a better view for you. I know there's a lot of distraction uh, for you to see it. But even artists, when they draw the picture of Jesus' prayers, it's, it's always with artwork that doesn't, in my mind, relate at all to what was really transpiring with Jesus. And even modern artwork or media that's oftentimes... They all do their best to express what seems to be happening. But what was happening in this prayer? I'm going to read it all. But I want you to start reading with me. With the thought of what would this prayer mean to you if you were listening to it? If I'm correct in imagining that in chapter 15 verse 1... 
Jesus begins the walk toward the Garden of Gethsemane. And then when he gets to the garden, he says this prayer for his disciples. Only John, John records this prayer. All the other synoptics will tell us that when he enters the garden, do you remember what he does? He separates the disciples. And when he enters the garden, who does he take with him? Peter, James, and John. And they go to a different place. And that's where those private prayers that we're going to refer to, we're going to study tonight, happen. But imagine that you're one of the twelve and perhaps any other disciples who have tagged along to hear. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I have received your name to your people. You gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given is from you, because I have given them the words you gave me. And they have received them and have known for certain that I have come from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who have, you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. And while I was with them, I was protecting them by your name, that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also may be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them, and will continue to make it known, so that the love you have loved me with may be in them, and I What was this prayer? Was it a parting prayer? The, the final prayer someone says before they die. And the point is, is, he prayed this before he went on across the Kidron Valley in John chapter 18, verse 1. But he prayed three more times. He also prayed on the cross, Luke 23, 34. He prayed again on the cross, Father, into thy hand I trust my spirit. This is not his parting prayer. But it appears to be, at least in record, the last public prayer he prays with his disciples. Some have called it a priestly prayer. It is the great high priestly prayer. And I think it, in the 5th century there was an Egyptian elder who uh, described it so. 
Uh, not that that really matters a lot, but that, he was the first one to ever call this the high priestly prayer. Or, quote, quote, Jesus was acting as a high priest on behalf of his people, Clement of Alexandria said. But yet, there is no scripture in the Old Testament that talks about the prayer of a high priest. There is a priestly blessing that's recorded in number 622, the Lord bless you and keep you. But that really wasn't a prayer as much as it was a blessing upon the person. So what was it? I believe it was an intercessionary, intercessionary prayer. He interceded for all of them. I pray for them. John 17, verse 9. Holy Father, protect them by your name. I pray for those who believe in me through their word. And may they all be one and let them be with me where I am. Notice Jesus is praying very little. He does begin talking to the Father, glorifying the Father, and glorifying the purpose that Jesus had been given by his Father. The vast majority of the prayer is about others. Now, this would be the perfect time for me to say and to ask you that when you pray, really truthfully, what do you pray the most about? Me. me. Yeah. Even Jesus in the model prayer doesn't exclude that. Don't misunderstand. That's not wrong. What does he say? Give me my daily bread in the model prayer. So there's nothing wrong about you mentioning you. But imagine that you are knowing that in 24 hours your life will be gone. Now who do you pray for? Now you might pray that you won't suffer. You might pray about what you will want to see on the other side. But bulk of what we will think about, if we're godly, is we'll be thinking of others. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing in this prayer of intercession. But it was more than just a moment of intercession. In fact, you notice the word's not in there. Not in there. It is in the New Testament, but it's not in the prayer. But there is something in the prayer that is clearly evident. It is a prayer about glory. Notice he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. What did God, what did Jesus say in the prayer? This is the moment of glorification. This is the moment, moment of this grand ascension to the purpose that we're trying to accomplish. Even in verse 4 and 5, he says, I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Therefore, or now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. What is this prayer about? The glorification of God. He goes on, and he says it, I only put it on this one little thing, but he says, I received your name to the people you gave me from the world. And then he goes on, and he repeats the name. I've shared the name, they understand the name, except the name, the name, the name. Go through in your Bible, underline it, and you'll see how many times he references it. Well, God's name is who he is. It is his authority, it is his glory. And so he says, everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. And I am glorified, Jesus says in this. And I have given them the glory you have given me and that they will see my glory. I'm going to suggest to you that that's what I think this prayer is about. It is not about just, even though we emphasize it, and don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that we shouldn't. This is not a prayer for unity. That's a sub-point. Jesus did pray that we would all be united. 
he makes that emphasis several, three times in verses 20 through verse 23. You'll read in your own Bible. But Jesus knew that his disciples would be unified if they would follow his words. The words that he had given the apostles and the words that the apostles would give to them. Because the only thing that would unify them is those words. When we try to unify, what do we usually unify on? What's the first part of the sentence? I think, I believe, or if you're in a denominational setting, the convention has agreed, or the denomination has decided, well, ultimately, no one will ever agree. Evidence by the dissolving and breaking up of many modern American denominations right before our eyes. But the prayer wasn't about unity. It was about glory. About the glory that God had planned for the Father, that for the Son, and the Son's acknowledgement that this is what this is all about. Me glorifying you, and you glorifying me. There's a passage in the Old Testament Look in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, in one of the visions of Daniel, I said 9, it's 7, sorry, it's right there in front of me. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. So I continued watching into the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming from the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. And he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, so that those of every people, nation, and language would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. I don't think Jesus had in mind this verse when he prayed what he said. But I do believe that what this verse tells us, that in the prophecy idea of what God was going to accomplish in Jesus Christ, there would be an ascension and glorification of the Son. And the presence of the Son at the Ancient of Days, and what would the Ancient of Days give him? Not a lollipop, not a Reese's bar. What did the Ancient of Days give the Son? Thank you. Dominion and glory, which would come from being king. I would give you a kingdom. And so the prophecy is forecasting everything that Jesus has on his mind because as he prayed, he was praying for our unity. Don't misunderstand my point. But the point of the prayer was he said, Jesus is assigned this task. And Jesus prayed to his father and said, glorify me, even as I will glorify you. And I want you to make that connection because this is a prayer that he says, I believe in the hearing of the apostles. So that they truly understood what was about to trans to happen. That's why when Jesus goes and he takes Peter, James, and John and he asks them to stay up with him, what did he expect? He wanted them to watch. I just told you in my prayer this grand glory that I've been telling you in little snippets all throughout your ministry, or my ministry. And now before the Father, I have prayed this prayer. Surely they will understand the enormity of the moment. But they will not be able, because the flesh, Jesus will say, uh, the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, what do we want to make a point about all of this? In Acts chapter 2, when Peter announces the gospel for the first time, it is not just a message that God is going to redeem your sin. 
It is not just merely a message that Joel prophesies that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the thesis of some senses of the sermon. But the conclusion of the sermon, the conclusion of most sermons means what? What's a conclusion? This is what it's all about, right? right that's why a conclusion is written. This is what it's all about. And what is the conclusion of Peter's sermon? Let's all look there. Open up your Bible. Look in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2. He says in verse 29, Brothers and sisters, I confidently say to you about the patriarch David, he's dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He was a prophet. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, nor his flesh experienced decay. And God raised this Jesus. We are witnesses of this. Therefore, since... Therefore... Since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. That's what the message was about. The glory that the Father had planned for His Son was a glory that has finally been realized. He has sat down at the right hand of God and He is now King of Kings. And God brought that about in Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to read these verses with different eyes. Because we turn to this verse usually to try to silence denominationalism, particularly with Catholicism, by saying that the Pope can't be held head of the church. That's fine. That's a truth that needs to be brought out of this passage. But I want you to see what it was Paul really said. Verse 20. God exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his foot and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of one who fills all things in every way. God accomplished his purpose to bring his son to be king. So God was glorified in what he accomplished in Jesus. And Jesus was glorified by God when he surrendered to that purpose. And you and I need to understand that when we start talking about that and, and, <laughs> and often give lip service to our own obedience, that we don't fully understand the enormity of sacrifice that went into that. In John chapter 13, Look how Jesus says this passing statement in John 13. So when he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you a little while longer. Well, look for me. And it goes on with the conversation. This was a prayer that meant that on the mind of Jesus was the glory that God had for him. To make him a king through the processes that we think of of redemption, and rightly so. But through the fact of him being a king in a way the world would not accept him. So, what happens next? If the, my reading of the Gospels are right, that Jesus offers this prayer, 
in John 17. He has offered it as he began the conversation in the upper room, starting in John chapter um, 14. Well, 13. And he washes their feet, and they've established in Jesus' celebrating of that feast, the Lord's Supper. He walks with them to the garden. He says the prayer. And then... He says, oh, sorry, well, I'm going to skip that one. So Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking on Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray, so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. And after leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. My betrayer is near. The prayer that Jesus uttered is a different prayer that he says privately. Notice the prayer that he says in the hearing of the twelve and the disciples who may have been with him was a prayer for their own benefit to see the glory that God had. And, and that may sound like, oh, you're, you're saying that he said a prayer and didn't mean it. I don't think so. <laughs> In fact, before the tomb of Lazarus, what did Jesus even say? Do you remember? I said these words so that those around me would hear. Jesus was saying a prayer, a statement of glorification to the Father right before the tomb of Lazarus. In the garden, he was saying the same thing for the benefit of the twelve. But not everything he prayed was for them. And the prayer that happens here, deep in the garden, where Jesus is apart from the twelve, I doubt they were a mile away or anything. They weren't very far away. The garden's not an enormously large place. But the point is, is that something significant happened. It showed the submission of Jesus. In John 17, I will tell you that he acknowledges that submission. Go back and look. Do you remember what he said? Do you remember what he said? I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. I did what you asked me to do. And in that prayer, in that public prayer, there was a very clear announcement of his self-awareness that I have done what you have asked me to do. But here he comes to the quiet moment of the garden by himself. And he has angst. One of the things that it should show us, though, is in John chapter 17, you might say, well, the twelve were there, so they wrote down what he prayed. But the prayer that he utters here, all the synoptics say he says it by himself. How did they come to know what that prayer was? Well, the answer is the Holy Spirit guided them in everything. There doesn't seem to be any conversation between Jesus once he's arrested 
and the twelve till his death, except the few statements we see that Jesus makes on the cross. But after he's raised, remember, he talks to the disciples, to the apostles, about the kingdom of God for 40 days. It could be very well that they asked him, what did you pray? Or he may have told them. It doesn't even really matter because the Holy Spirit was going to make sure that we would be told the truth of what really happened. But the point is that, is that the Holy Spirit wanted you to know what Jesus prayed privately. Do you want me to know all of your private prayers? I can guarantee you, you don't want to know mine. <laughs> but we're told this for a very distinctive and intentional reason. That the way that the Father would glorify the Son would be not the way the world would glorify anyone. That he would die And in that prayer, he addresses God as Abba, Father. Or in the Gospel of Mark, it says Abba, Father. Father, Father. How, how does that sound to you? I remember once growing up, I grew up in a very good church. But it also had some very unique qualities. Like, we, I think we have a unique quality. But... We were prohibited from saying Abba in the assembly. Now that sounds weird. Does that sound weird to anyone else besides me? Why? It's in the Bible. <laughs> like why? But they, they said you can't say Abba because it means father, so you just need to say father. Like, okay, fine. But Jesus said father, father, if Mark's account is. And there has to be, in essence, an understanding that it means more than Father. I am not trying to suggest that Jesus said Daddy, or Papa Don, or Papa God, or anything like that. I don't want to be irre irreverent at all. But the point is that in our language, we have a much more vast array of words that we use to describe different things. And I am not a linguist or the... Or, don't know any, a lot about ancient language, but I do know there was a great limitation on the words, depending on the language. But there won't be anyone who will tell you that what Jesus said was not the most intimate thing he could say about the relationship he had with God. Abba, Father. When do you say those words? You say them when your heart is open. You say them when your heart is break them, breaking. You say them when what matters to the conversation is the relationship that exists between the two parties. And Jesus said, Abba, Father. He didn't use any of the terms of the Old Testament where God was described as a great warrior, even though in prayers, don't misunderstand. That's appropriate. It doesn't matter which passage of Scripture you'll look to, and you'll say, well, God was called this here. God was called. I know that. But why did Jesus in this prayer say, Abba, Father? That's what I'm asking. It's because he didn't need to say to God, you're the great warrior. You're the great power. You're the great I am. He didn't say any of that. He said, Father, Father. Because he had come to the point after acknowledging the glory that the Father had placed on him and foreseen in the prophecy of Daniel that he would be brought before the throne room and receive from God a kingdom that would be planned. But he knew the path to that glory. And he said, Father, Father. Here is the Son of God, the King of kings, Lord of lords, only begotten, suffering servant, wonderful counselor, Prince of peace, Bright and morning star, Alpha and Omega, Lamb of God. And he says, Abba, Abba. Father, Father. Quit being concerned that your prayers are formal enough. 
quit being concerned with some kind of formality of, of the structure of the model prayer. By the way, that is a model prayer, not a prayer to be copied. But even Jesus in the model prayer, you remember? He begins it by identifying the person to whom you pray as Father. I think that tells us from the outset that Jesus intends prayer to be much more of a communication than it is some rhetorical device that we use to create a sense of holiness and reverence. When you talk to your children, I hope you don't try to create a sense of holiness and reverence. I hope when you talk to your spouse that you're not trying to create a an environment of, of, of wonder and love. I just hope that your heart opens up to the people that you say are important to you. And so too, when you pray to God like your Savior did at this moment of his life, he said, Abba, Abba. It's wonderfully comforting that we're given the same privilege. But the second thing that he says is, if you are willing. It depends on the, like in Mark's gospel, it is, if it, Matthew's gospel says, if it is possible, in Mark's gospel it says, everything is possible for you. And without trying to, to resolve what we think ought to be duplications, which should say the same thing, in the final analysis, they all do say the same. The difference only appears on the surface. What the Father wills is possible. Jesus is asking if the Father can, in the realm of his will and purpose, create a way for Jesus to avoid the cup. He says, if you are willing. He just prayed. Glorify your son as your son has glorified you. He said that as they entered into the garden. And then he left behind nine of the twelve. And then he walked a little further and then he said, Abba, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. Why? Why? Jesus wants God's wish, God's desire, God's intent to be fulfilled in this moment. Notice he surrenders, even in this language, the, the, the reality that this is you, if you are willing. And for you and me, I, I, we'll talk about the cup in just a second. But when you say that in your prayers, if you do it all, you really understand what you're saying. When I prayed for John Banks to live, I didn't want to say, if you are willing. I wanted to say, God, heal him. But I knew that my Savior's model was to say, if you are willing. And I don't think Jesus is saying it tritely or without meaning. I think he really does mean exactly what I'm trying to get us to mean when we say it. Three times he said, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Jesus was God in the flesh, John 1 tells us. He was the Son to the Father and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're told that at the end of time, he will turn the kingdom back to the Father who gave it to him. There is a sense of this relative subordination. I, don't, I hate to use that language, but for me, that's the most convenient language for me to describe the son's knowledge of his relationship with his father. But he's willing to even allow the father to reign supreme over every decision he makes. 
But in this room, I don't know if we all live that way. I mean, when you're a teenager, do you really let God decide everything for you? When you're a teenager, do you let what's happening in your wardrobe match what's going on at school? Or are you letting your wardrobe be decided by what God says? When you're a young adult and um, all your guy friends want you to hang out with them when you're when you should be home taking care of your wife and your children, do you listen to your guy friends? or Because I really need that. On and on we could go. I've been everywhere that I've taken you. If you are willing, God, let this cup pass from me. It was a continuation of the attitude he had even in this prayer of the Lord. I've done all that you've asked me to do. I'm going to continue to do it. And he invites us to do the same. You know, even in the model prayer, look in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, you should pray this way. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This isn't a sermon about the model prayer. But I think it's worth making the point that at the beginning of the model, Jesus says, your prayer is not about me. Your name will be honored as holy. And your kingdom, your will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the condition of all that we do in our life. God is willing. The old country expression, uh, the Lord be willing and the creek don't rise. That was a great little barbershop song that I sang when I was a kid. Had no idea what it meant until I had to face dark times in my life. But my dark times have never been as dark as what Jesus experienced. And he went to that quiet little place in the garden by himself hoping that the three that he loved especially would be waiting for him to lift him up when he came back out, knowing, as Luke will describe it, sweating drops of blood. So intense was the emotional aspect of what was going on in this private prayer. He wanted to come out to three that he hoped would help him, but they were asleep. And he addressed his petition. Remove this cup from me. And two weeks ago, Jeremy actually presented a little bit of my lesson right here before the Lord's Supper. So I'm not going to try to articulate more than what he said. I thought what he did was very good. But I want you to notice he says this. And I think in a very real sense that what Jesus was experiencing on the grand and emotional level was something that you and I can't relate to. Look in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10. The writer is obviously showing the superiority of Jesus and his ministry and his sacrifice over the law. And so he notes that in verse 4, in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He talks about how, and how uh, unfortunately unhopeful the sacrificial system was in the Old Testament. And he says that in this quote, verse 7, then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll, I've come to do your will, O God. After he says above, you did not desire to light in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He then says, verse 9, see, I've come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By his will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That the depth and the enormity to which Jesus was praying let this cup from me. It was a cup that only he could bear. Because only his body was planned for him. 
I have appointed a body for you. And not only have I appointed a body for you, I've appointed your body to be in a purpose. Now, it's true that the word cup has a metaphorical or figure of speech kind of application. It's also used in a positive way. Um, pro probably the most famous one, uh, look in Psalm 23. Psalm, actually, uh, Psalm 16. Both of them will work fine, but I like 16 the best. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 16. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. That, that it had a meaning to fate or future. But usually when the prophets used it, it had more to do with judgment, as referenced in Jeremy's presentation about, about a week and a half ago. But Jeremiah 25, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take this cup of the wine of my wrath from my hand and make all the nations to whom I am sending you drink from. And the cup also comes up in the book of Revelation with the same kind of imagery and purpose. So when Jesus says, let this cup pass from you, it was a cup that only really he could bear because only he could bear the weight of judgment for the sins of the world. The prophet Isaiah will describe that for us that way. You remember in Isaiah 55, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53? Look again. Isaiah 53, verse 4. That he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains and in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punished for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned away to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The cup he had to drink was the punishment due the sinner. And he was sinless. And Lord, he says, if it be willing, remove this cup from me. We can talk all day long if we think he was weak. We can talk all day long if we think there was something wrong with that. But once again, I am never going to talk to someone that I have never walked a mile in their moccasins and say, you need to do it this way. Because there's miles of moccasins that all of you in this room have walked that I've never walked. And there might be miles of moccasins that I've walked that none of you have ever walked. But none of us have walked even a step in the feet of Jesus' moccasins, figure of speech. He didn't wear moccasins where he had to be chosen to wear and be given a body, live in that body innocently, free from all sin, and then bear from his own father the punishment due all sinners. Remove this cup from me. If it is at all possible. What's interesting is in Matthew chapter 20, I wish we talked about the apostles more. They're a funny bunch. They're a lot like us. But notice in, in Matthew chapter 20. No, that's the wrong passage. No, it is the right passage. Sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Matthew 20. It says in verse 26, James and John's mother approached Jesus with her sons and wanted them to be placed in a great position. And Jesus answers in verse 22, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And we are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand in life is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those who make me prepare by my Father. And I just hear the kids, so i got to finish quick. He warns the apostle of the same because he acknowledges his mission. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You've given me authority, Matthew 28. He has all the authority in the world. 
that he submits to the will of the Father. He was heard because of his piety, and he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And guess what? We're invited to do the same. While we can never pray a prayer exactly with the same uh, reasons for which Jesus prayed, we can pray with the same emotion as we must face the same realities when we have to yield to God in obedience to do what he has commanded. Thank you. I will praise you with all